In the spirit of Imagine 2020, Denver's cultural plan, and in celebration of the 15th annual Five Points Jazz Festival, I would like to introduce the Rico Jones Quartet. Let's give them a hand. The quartet is saxophonist and composer Rico Jones, take a bow, Gabe Rube on bass, Kevin Matthews on drums, and Jack Dunleavy on piano. The Rico Jones Quartet will be performing at the Five Points Jazz Festival today from 6 to 7 p.m. inside the Crossroads Theater. Please visit the Arts and Venues table for more information on the Five Points Jazz Festival and Imagine 2020. At this time, without further ado, let's welcome the Rico Jones Quartet.
Wonderful, give them a hand. Again, the Rico Jones Quartet. They will be playing this evening during the Five Points Jazz Festival. Give them another hand. Thank you, gentlemen, thank you so much. Great job, great job. Again, welcome to Mayor Hancock's Cabinet in the Community. We are extremely thankful to have each and every one of you here this morning just to engage us around community events, community concerns and issues, and all the wonderful things that are happening in this great city. Wonderful, wonderful to be in District 10. My name is Sean Johnson. I am the Mayor's Senior Advisor for Community Affairs, and I am here to take care of anything you need today, as well as Rosalind Alston and the entire team. I want to give a special thank you to the Denver Public Library, who has always been a huge partner for the mayor's cabinet in the community and getting all of those wonderful flyers out to you. And then one last shout out is to Starbucks. All of the refreshments that you are enjoying as far as coffee and tea and all of your beverages have come from Starbucks. Give them a hand. Thank you, thank you so much. At this time, I would like to welcome everyone to come and take a seat, take a load off, and enjoy the time that we prepared for you this morning. I would like to invite you to um, welcome, we're in his house, but let's welcome him and give him a hand of applause. Let's bring to the podium Denver Botanic Garden CEO, Brian Vogt. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. I am so pleased to see all of you here, and I welcome you heartily uh, to your Botanic Gardens. It's great to have you here as our guest today, and I hope you will take full advantage of it and explore the gardens for the whole rest of the day. If you want to kind of decompress and get back to nature a little bit and feel back in tuned with yourself, this is the place to be. And thankfully, the, uh, the weather's turned, and we have a, a bright, sunny day ahead of us. I want to throw out a couple of thank yous. Uh, the first is to all of the city staff that Denver Botanic Gardens works with almost on a daily basis, they are such tremendous partners. A lot of them are very unsung. And I particularly want to thank our friends at Parks and Rec. Their leader, Happy Haynes, is here. Can you give them a big hand? They're, they've been great for us. Thank you. What you may not know about the gardens is that all of this magic is fueled by an amazing, amazing team. We have 250 staff. We have 2,200 volunteers. It's the highest number of any major garden in North America. And they are happy, good-hearted, hard-working, amazing people that you see out here on a daily basis. And I hope that when you're at the gardens and you see them pulling weeds, you might stop and say, hey, thank you for keeping our garden so beautiful. We also have 41,000 households who are members of the gardens from throughout the entire region. We draw in about a quarter of a million tourists from all parts outside of Colorado every year. Uh, this is a happening place, but what you may not know is that this is a place of science. We're an accredited museum. We have herbaria and laboratories. We do research work all around the world. The head of our hort horticulture department is helping developing countries diversify the plant material that they have to grow coffee. If you can imagine, coffee in, is being centered at Denver Botanic Gardens Coffee Research is. We're doing work in step environments around the world, and you may see us in neighborhoods throughout Metro Denver in food deserts where we've taken on urban food initiatives to bring fresh vegetables to people that can't reach it easily within their own communities. Uh, this is an amazing dynamic place because of all these good souls uh, that make it so. And so I hope you feel that vibe when you're here today. And if you need a bit of relaxation, please make yourself at home wandering through the gardens and see our spectacular one-of-a-kind Calder exhibit. And with that, uh, another partner who's been so fantastic for us. We've known him before he became a councilman, and then we celebrated his election uh, to city council. He's been a great communicator back and forth about city issues and garden issues. Um, he understands us, he cares about us, and we so appreciate him. Please welcome your councilman, our councilman, Wayne New. Thank you very much. I'm going to have to hire Brian as my PR director, I tell you. He's great. 
Thank you for all coming today, and, and so proud to, to the mayor having this cabinet community here at District 10. You know, we have a beautiful district. You know, it is the best district in the city. I'm sure you all know that. So, you know, we go all the way from the Golden Triangle and all the wonderful museums we have, the Capitol Hill, Cheeseman, Congress Park, and all along Colfax and North Capitol Hill. And then we have just wonderful neighborhoods, Cherry Creek North and East and Country Club and Polo Club and Green Bowers and Alamo Pasita. So we have just a wonderful, wonderful district. Highest number of historic districts and historic homes in the entire city we have. And what's interesting is uh, we probably have the smallest geographic area, <clears throat> but all the districts have about the same number of residents, about 60,000 residents. So you can see how dense we are and uh, density in, the, in our areas of the city. So. We're just really pleased with our district and love being here and I appreciate being your, your council person. I want to thank Brian again for hosting us here. You know, I couldn't think of a better venue than this beautiful Botanic Gardens to host the event for the mayor. Let's give Brian and his staff another round of applause. <laughs> And also, I'd like to thank, I was so impressed with all the city departments that are here, all the tables. I hope you saw all the goodies there. They're free. So we brought a big bag to carry home some stuff. So we're, we're pleased and thank all the city departments for the wonderful job they're doing. I want to thank my staff, uh, Melissa Horn, who, who, my senior staff member, who just had her baby nine years ago, nine years, nine days ago. <laughs> wow. But, uh, and Ellen Becker is my new staff member. Ellen, wave your hand, she's right here. <clears throat> and my uh, wonderful wife, Leslie, who gives me all the great support. So she's wonderful as well, to helping me always. This uh, cabinet in the community is just a wonderful example of citizen participation and engagement. You know, I'm so glad the mayor is doing it here. We've been trying to do in, in, uh, in District 10, we try to do ask for participation a lot. <clears throat> we send out a newsletter. We hope to keep you informed what's going on. And we also <clears throat> enjoy our surveying. We try to survey all our residents on key issues, and your feedback really, really helps me. You know, we get 800 to 1,000 residents respond to each one of our surveys, and it's really, really helpful. So if you're not on our email list, back there at my table, I've got uh, business cards, and, and be sure and, and sign up to give me information, but also participate in the surveys. Yesterday was another example of great city participation. Yesterday, city community leaders and business leaders helped present some community need projects to the, to the city budget staff and city department heads. A real uh, asking for letting a communication and discussion about what are the important community needs that you have and, and hopefully then maybe some can be funded in the uh, 2018 budget. So I'm really thankful of Brendan Hanlon and Stephanie Adams and all the department heads who participated in that and it was just a wonderful, wonderful discussion. Thank you again for being here and I can't uh, say how pleased I am to welcome the mayor being here and so uh, be sure and ask him all those tough questions like you ask me all the time now. So it's a real wonderful, wonderful dialogue to have these kind of uh, cabinets and community. And so <clears throat> thank you again for being here. Thanks. Good morning, District 10. How you doing this morning? Give yourselves a round of applause for being here this morning. I am so excited we are here in District 10, and I'm going to join the chorus of thank yous to Brian Vogt, a dear, dear friend, but a wonderful leader of one of the best, if not the best, botanic gardens in the entire United States of America. Uh, yeah. <laughs> he, he was just telling me it was the second most visited botanic gardens in the country, 1.2 million people last year. Uh, and I think that is phenomenal, don't you? We, we like to be on top though, Brian, so wherever you gotta manufacture a few extra numbers, maybe throw your volunteers in that number. We can get on top or something. Let, let me thank you all for being here. I, I'm excited to be here in District 10. I wanna thank Councilman Wayne New uh, for his support and assistance in getting here to this moment. Uh, we have so many people come together to make the cabinet community a possible, this, a possible event in the life of our community. And I gotta tell you, we started this probably second year in office, and it has turned out to be something I hope remains in the DNA of this city, where the elected and appointed officials, the cabinet of the mayor, comes to a community 
and is face to face with the people we represent every day to answer your questions, to hear your concerns, uh, to celebrate your successes. Uh, more importantly, for you to, to know that your, your, your government is here for you because that's why we exist, for the people of this great city. And as someone who's grown up in a city, I'm proud of the effort that the public officials make to be here every morning. Let's acknowledge a few of them. Uh, first, I want to acknowledge, we, you know your councilman, uh, but he has uh, 12 other colleagues on council who happen to be here this morning. I see two members, two of our at-large members are here. The Honorable Debbie Ortega, is that a grandchild you're holding? Oh, all right, all right, all right. Thank you, Debbie Ortega. I saw Councilwoman uh, Robin Kanish when I walked in. There she is, Councilwoman at large. I understand Councilwoman Mary Beth Sussman is here. There she is. District 5 is in the house. And I see Councilwoman Peggy, former Councilwoman Peggy Lehman in the crowd from District 4. Served 12 years on Denver City Council. Oh, you can't act shy now. <laughs> Thank you. I see two members of the Board of Education. Your representative, Mike Johnson, is here. Raise your hand, Mr. Johnson. The Honorable Mike Johnson, Board of Education. And Michelle Espiritu is here as well. Thank you, Michelle, for being here. Did I miss any other elected officials in the room? I'm going to ask all city and our city uh, appointees and agency leaders and uh, external partners, stakeholders, like Elba Wedgworth from Denver Health, uh, to raise your hand so folks know who's in the room today. I want you to see around this room all the city officials who have come to be a part of this effort. Thank you all. Please, thank you. So Cabinet Community is our opportunity to update you on some of the things that the city is doing. It's our opportunity to hear from you, again, your questions, your concerns, uh, for you to meet your public officials. Uh, because we're a little bit behind schedule, I'm going to cut my comments short because we have some... Uh, presentations for you. And I want you to know where these presentations come from. We can come and talk to you about a lot of things. But what we do in preparation of coming into this community, to your community, is we talk with our 311 staff and we hear about the calls that have come in from you and your neighbors, and what are, what's the top of mind for, uh, uh, for you. We sit with your council representative and we, uh, we ask him the tough questions. What are your constituents asking you about? Uh, and so we try to align really the presentations with some of your current uh, issues and top of mind issues that you have contacted the city about. So hopefully today these presentations will be right on target. If not, that's what the latter part of the meeting is our get together is all about. This uh, fair or forum, if you will, is set up for you to come and meet with us face to face. If you don't hear your issue presented here today, your questions are answered from this podium with the brief presentations, we invite you to come and see us. I will be at a table, uh, the police representatives will be at a table, the sheriff will be at a table, the planning department will be at a table, parks and rec, wherever, uh, whoever you want to talk to, we should be here uh, to address your concerns. One of the things I always do is just give you a very brief rundown of what we've been doing, then we're going to get these presentations started. But the real crux and heart of what we want to do is to have these face-to-face one-on-ones uh, with the residents of District 10 and those who've traveled from around the city to be here this morning. But I always start with asking you to celebrate the men and women who keep us safe. Uh, you're going to hear a public safety uh, report from Commander Sonia and from Deputy Chief Keonis, but we also have our sheriff's department here. We have our fire, fire department here. We also have our paramedics here, our first responders. And so I'm going to ask them to stand up and receive your appreciation just for helping to keep us all safe. Ladies and gentlemen from the Public Safety Department, please stand up and be acknowledged. Man. Yesterday, we had a wonderful uh, housing summit, our third annual housing summit. 475, 500 people showed up to talk about the issues that are, of course, near and dear to our hearts right now in the city of Denver. There are housing uh, pressures that we're feeling, the rising cost of housing, the lack of housing uh, that we're experiencing. Uh, Eric Sullivan, who is here, the executive director of our HOPE office, the mayor's office of housing and opportunities for people everywhere, and I stood up and announced a new a strategy to address the challenges around housing. And it, it's the goal, our objective really is for us to broaden our stance and to go deeper and to recognize that it's more than just about putting a roof over the heads of the people in the city. It's also about good jobs and it's also about good health. And so our strategies are about bringing down the silos 
and about coordinating uh, much better uh, through our departments to better serve the people across the, the homeless, the housing pipeline. And so today, hopefully you'll hear a little bit about more about what we're doing. If you want to know about, more about our homeless to housing pipeline services and programs and the hope effort that doc, uh, Dr. That Eric Sullivan, you're now a doctor, Eric, Eric um, is leading for the city. I want to encourage you to stop by his hope desk and, and ask him, or you can talk to me as well, but we'll be here to talk about that. We also uh, want you to know that to, this is May is Mental Health Month, and you may have seen me on the news yesterday talking about the challenges of the mental health uh, concerns we have in our, in our city. Um, when we talk about our homeless, uh, we estimate 40 percent or more individuals on our street are suffering from some form of behavior health, mental health challenge or addiction. Uh, the opiate uh, challenges in the city have been rampant as we have seen across the country. It has arrived here in Denver um, and our, our first responders, our police officers, our, our mental health, our medical um, responders and providers are doing everything they can and to, to deal with the, the, the challenge that we're facing and it is overwhelming as a city. Um, as you may have seen, we are dealing with it in the library, um, at Central Library, which is a unique space because it's open to everyone. And they have gone in. We have dealt with overdoses. We have dealt with and recently learned, of course, about the dealing that's going on in the library. Our library staff has done a tremendous job to try to provide those services and to provide the outlet um, to those individuals. Um, but we simply cannot tolerate what's happening. And we have been working for weeks. Uh, the media has elevated the, the story. But I want you to know that our police department, the library staff in particular, uh, social workers, peer navigators have been working tirelessly around the clock to address the issue. And so while we applaud them, we as a city must also embrace them and make sure that we're doing everything we can to help them. But it just is a, just a sample of the challenge that we're dealing with across the city. And I know one of the issues you're gonna hear about today is the Cherry Creek Drive Pass, or underpass that some of you have asked about. And we're gonna hear a presentation from Public Works about that, and maybe you wanna know more from the Public Safety Department about it. Let me move on so we can get going. I wanna also just be briefly tell you about the fact that, how many of you have attended or weighed in on the GO bond process, the general obligation bond process they play, taking place in the city? Uh, come on, hands high. Okay, there you go. Don't be shy. Thank you for doing that. Um, every 10, 15 years, the city of Denver comes to you and says it's time for us to do another general obligation bond to upgrade, to improve, to add to our, the great amenities of the city, but also to address some of our infrastructure challenges. We're estimating anywhere from eight to $900 million in bonds this year, probably will be the largest in the history of this city. So your input is very important. In the next coming weeks, I shall receive a report from the citizen committees that have been pouring over priorities for the city. Um, so it's not too late. We just, if you wanna share some thoughts with Councilman New while he's here, he said he will be here to take all your suggestions. <laughs> and then finally, registration for Denver Days is now open. Um, several years ago, I think about 2013, we recognized that we didn't do anything in the city that brought our communities together. And it was during the mayoral campaign of 2011 that we learned that the city of Denver had become more of a hindrance to helping residents come together, get to know their neighbors, than we were a partner. And that challenge was brought to us by a constituent who said, I try to bring my neighbors together, and the permitting process was so onerous and costly that it was a problem. And so Denver Days was a way for us, created as a way for us, and city council passed an ordinance to use this week, the first week of August, to celebrate our heritage as a city and to encourage residents to come together to do block parties, do service projects, to celebrate your neighborhood. The reality is if we know who's on our block, we're all safer. We can, we're aware when things don't belong and we can act better. But if you've ever done a block party, it's amazing how you'll find people who are on your block you had no idea live just down the street. We have become a front door, garage door community. And that's not how Denver was created. And so I encourage you all, if you're at all interested, what is the website? It's not on my cheat sheet here. Anybody know? Yes, it is um, 
<laughs> all right, look up Denver Days. We'll get it for you. We'll make sure you get it today. But, but we, we want you all to register. Bring your neighborhood together. So here are the presentations you're going to hear, and we're going to fly through them because we want to make sure you get to the tables. Thank you to all of our external partners who showed up today to be a part of this, to uh, share resources and information with the residents of District 10. First, we're going to start with Denver Public Works. It will be followed by a report from Excise and Licensing. Uh, Parks and Recreation is here, and then we'll have your safety report. So reporting for Denver Public Works to talk about traffic and congestion, construction, street closures, bagging meters, paid parking, and effects on small business in all of six minutes will be will be the Interim Director of Public Works, George Delaney. Well, that's certainly a lot to cover in a, six minutes. Um, uh, first of all, welcome this morning. Uh, um, thank you all for so many of you turning out. Beautiful day outside, Public Works. We love these kinds of days. No rain, no snow, no hail, no wind. Uh, just good old Denver sunshine. We can, we can deal with that. Can't get in trouble with good old Denver sunshine. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about transportation, the impact of growth, and a, a, a little bit about the construction, especially, and I'll focus a bit in, uh, on uh, District 10. Um, because I know that's one of the things that you're all um, interested and concerned, excuse me, concerned about. We all know that this city has changed drastically in the last 10, 20 years. We've become a very vibrant urban environment. But the unprecedented growth we've experienced in the last two or three years has cer certainly put a lot of pressure on our city's infrastructure. Everything from our roads to our sidewalks to our parks to our sewers to uh, everything you can think of that makes a city run. Back in 2008, uh, the Denver Department of Public Works uh, developed uh, a strategic transportation plan. And that plan recognized that there's only so much capacity in our city. We cannot go and expand the streets that we have. They are pretty much fixed. So what we have to do is figure out a better way to use the capacity that we have to move people. And that plan was really focused on moving people, not moving cars, but moving people. And that was a big uh, um, divergence for public works to move away from cars to start talking about multimodal. So what does that mean? That means all of a sudden that you start thinking about the needs of pedestrians. You start thinking about the needs of bicycle riders. You start thinking about the needs of vehicles. That still is probably our main mode of transportation. But you start combining those things. You don't leave one out. And what you try to do is develop a system that provides equal opportunity to people that want to use those different systems um, and gives them choices. So if you want to walk to work, you can walk to work safely. If you want to bike, you can safely. If you want to take transit, we, we try to make sure that the bus stops and uh, the access to bus stops, sidewalks, are more, are more uh, accessible. So we've been working very diligently on trying to improve those. And the mayor mentioned the GEO bond. And I think one of the things that the Committee on Transportation is recommending is a lot of multimodal projects that will further expand our ability to meet those kinds of needs and give you all more, um, more choices. So, some of the issues that have come up with us have to do with things uh, that we've faced in public works, and I know you probably call 311 about, is traffic congestion, um, people driving through your neighborhoods to avoid areas where they can't get through because the roads are closed, uh, the impact of parking on, on our neighborhoods and in our uh, commercial areas, and for pedestrians, the ability to safely cross the street. So we've, we've been working on many different things, and, and we have a table here, and I have people here to come and talk to you, uh, so come and talk to us about these things. But for instance, we do things called a, a parking area management plan, where we go in and try to adjust parking, either through residential parking permits or other kinds of signing that helps people find places to park in their residential areas. We, um, in 2017, the mayor and the city council in their budget, for the first time ever, we have money in our budget to build sidewalks to fill gaps in along city property. So if there's a park that doesn't have a sidewalk along it, we will be putting in those sidewalks so people are, have access, uh, pedestrians can access not only the park, but also access the bus stops or whatever neighborhood they want to go to. Um, 
We've, and so, and we've also embarked on signal timing issues, uh, traffic signal timing to move traffic along better as well. So we're trying to address all these variety of modes uh, as, as well. Now here in District 10, you probably have seen, I drove it before I came over here, um, Cherry Creek Drive is undergoing some construction. Um, don't try to go west on Cherry Creek Drive. Um, turn on Alameda and go up and come down to University. Um, we are, we, um, but that's an example. When the contractor came to us, they said, look, if you let us close Cherry Creek Drive south for three or four months, we can get this project done much quicker uh, you know, faster and quicker. And we said, you can't close Cherry Creek Drive South for three months. That's not acceptable. So you'll notice you can go east on Cherry Creek Drive. We made them keep one lane open, but you can't go west. And that's the kind of thing that we deal with constantly. And I know here, especially in Cherry Creek, uh, we're, we're challenged with that uh, every day because all the development that's going on there, um, roads are closed and there's got to be alternatives and we have traffic plans that we hopefully can get people at least get around in the area. Although we know it's, it's inconvenient, but we hope that you know, that inconvenience doesn't last too long. So we have the Cherry Creek Drive South program going on. We are going to uh, install a neighborhood bikeway along Garfield from the Cherry Creek tail, Trail to 17th Avenue, which will start this fall. So there'll be a new bike trail along Garfield. Uh, we will put a new flashing signal uh, right out here out in front of the Denver Bot Botanic Gardens for pedestrians to cross. It's, a, it's called a hawk signal, which will flash as soon as pedestrians uh, activate it, so the traffic coming up um, um, the, uh, um, uh, the street will see it ahead of time, not come up too close to the, to the intersection to make it safer for pedestrians. Um, we are going to pay 15 lane miles of a road here in District 10. Uh, District 10's roads are in pretty good shape by our pavement condition index, but we do have 15 miles and we'll have a map and back to show you where we're going to, uh, we're going to, um, going to pay. Finally, just to give you an, uh, order, uh, an idea of order of magnitude. We bag meters, and you've probably seen the yellow bags and the red bags over the meters, and I know that those are somewhat disruptive to those of you trying to get into a, an area to park, especially if you're trying to do uh, shopping or business. We bagged 6,400 ba meters last year. 40% of them were in the Cherry Creek area which tells you that that's where the activity is. Now, what we try to do is bag them as short as possible because we charge the developer quite a bit of money to bag those meters. So they, want, they don't want to keep them bagged for very long. So we, we do bag meters. That is part of our job. We also give uh, permits to street occupancies. So if you want to close a lane of a street or close a part of a sidewalk, you have to come to us, get a permit. We charge you for those permits. We try to minimize the impact of those permits. But last year, we did 21 thousand of those permits citywide, about 15% of those were in District 10. So District 10 is a very is a hotbed of a lot of activity. Uh, we're trying to do our best to have multimodal projects in the district to kind of keep you all moving and give you the choices you need to get around and try to minimize construction. But in a, a period of unprecedented growth, that is a real challenge for our department. So I have a team in back. We're back in the far corner. Come and talk to us. Ask us our, your questions. And we'll try to give you the answers that uh, uh, the answers that you're looking for. So with that, I'd like to introduce Ashley Kilroy, who's the Executive Director of Excise and License, to talk to you all about marijuana. Good morning, everyone. I'm Ashley Kilroy, as George said, the uh, Director of Excise and Licenses. And before I jump into marijuana, I just want to give you a background about excise and licenses. We are the business licensing center for our city. We issue over 180 different licenses, everything from restaurants and food trucks to liquor and bars and restaurants and taverns. We also license security guards. We license your burglar alarms. We license short-term rentals. But then the one everybody cares about is marijuana. So I know when the mayor did the, his uh, analysis to see what your neighborhood wanted to talk about, you wanted to learn a little bit about what's going on with marijuana policy. My team and I have a table pretty much straight back there, so we'd welcome you to come see us. But one thing I was thinking about as I was getting ready to prepare to speak to you is that something we all forget about is we've had medical marijuana in Denver for 17 years. It was in 2000 when our voters voted in favor of legalizing medical marijuana. 
Since then and up until now, we continue to face um, citizen-initiated ordinances on a variety of different marijuana-related topics, and I think we've had about six or seven elections since that 2000, and every time our voters have said yes to marijuana. In 2012, it was for retail marijuana, and we implemented our first retail marijuana sales on January 2014. We've worked really hard, so that's now been three years with retail marijuana, worked really hard to try to get strict rules and robust regulations, you know, implementing the will of the voters, while also balancing the needs and wants of our neighborhoods and our communities, and listening to our schools and listening to our health care partners, and really making sure we have everyone at the table as we move forward into this uncharted territory. You know, we, um, you know, we're constantly monitoring and watching what we're doing, and we know we, you know, we've got to keep a close eye on it and change and, and make changes and track and monitor what we're doing. But right now and over the last couple of years, we have become a model for other cities and other jurisdictions who come to Denver to see how we do it. I think we do have the most strict rules and regulations in our country around legalized marijuana. So the next phase that we're getting ready to embark on you probably remember just in, 2000, uh, just in uh, November in 2016, our voters voted in favor of social consumption. So marijuana social consumption, what you might think of as pot clubs. So that passed and we are in the process of moving forward with figuring out how we implement this. The city, we, we started right away in January, in, right, I mean, it passed in November. In December, we impaneled a, a really large work group to hear everybody's viewpoints on what this should look like. We met every two weeks for two to three hours from January until just about now, about April. Since then, based on all that input, we've put together a bunch of rules and regulations. We're going to be holding a big public hearing on June 13th, and I welcome all of you to that. I can provide you more information and date and times if you come see my, me at my table. But it's also online. You're also, we have online the draft rules and regulations, and we have a way for you to respond and give feedback. You also can call me directly, and I'm happy to sit down and talk to you about it. But what this initiative basically does is it gives individuals the rights to come down to excise and license and apply for a permit to have a designated consumption area in a business or at a special event. And so that's what our challenge is. How do we regulate that appropriately? So some of the things that we've put in place, I'll just give you, we have a whole lot of rules and regulations, but I'll give you some of them. Um, quickly, basically, for sort of the brick and mortar special events and for the, and for the special events, um, no alcohol would be allowed, no dual consumption. Also, we're saying that these designated consumption areas cannot be in a residential area. We also have put proximity restrictions around them, so they can't be within 1,000 feet of a school, they can't be within 1,000 feet of a daycare, can't be within 1,000 feet of a swimming pool or a rec center. Um, got a couple other things around there, restrictions on advertising, but then what we've done is at the end, even once these, these uh, groups uh, qualify for a permit, they still have to go through a full-blown needs and desires hearing with the community. So the community would be able to come down Excuse me, we'd have a, um, a hearing officer and the community would be able to come down and tell us what you think and whether or not your neighborhood needs and desires this um, designated consumption area. And finally, for that special events piece, you know, we're still not exactly sure. We, once again, are in uncharted territory. Not exactly sure what to expect, but one thing that we've put on that is that we cannot, there will not be special events on public property. So no street parties, nothing in our parks for a designated consumption permit. If it's a special event, it would have to be on private property. So I know that's a lot for you to kind of to hear and digest right now. It's all online, and I'm back in the back and happy to answer questions and phone calls and meet with you if you'd like. Thank you. You got it? Come on. And next we have Happy Haynes from Parks and Rec. Thank you. Good morning. Are you out there? Good morning. It is a great morning, isn't it? I am delighted to be back here. Uh, my team uh, from Denver Parks and Recreation is back here uh, in the corner. Please visit us and talk, uh, uh, share with us your views and your concerns and your ideas. 
about the parks and recreation facilities. And I'm here today to talk to you about a soon-to-be uh, recreation uh, facility uh, in District 10 and in, in this part of the community that's been long overdue. And it is the new Carla Madison Recreation Center. It is being constructed as we speak. Yep. <laughs> Uh, uh, those of you who live in the neighborhood are probably watching it every day, as I have been on the corner of uh, Colfax and Josephine. It is a first-of-a-kind urban uh, recreation center because of the uh, very small site that it sits on. It will rise up to four stories, so the first of its kind. Um, it is a, um, a center that costs nearly uh, $35 million. Um, it started with, uh, um, well, it started a long time ago with uh, former councilwoman Jeannie Robb. Is Jeannie in the room? Uh, well, uh, you, when you see Jeannie, you should give her props because it was her vision and her tenaciousness that uh, got us where we are today, and, and the other council members have picked up the mantle and, and continue uh, to advocate for the center. Uh, 11 different um, sources of funding uh, uh, created the opportunity for us to build this. Um, it started with $2 million from the uh, Better Denver bond that Mayor discussed uh, all the way back in 2007, and $21 million from the Tabor Reserves in 2014. Uh, the front entrance is on Colfax Avenue. It has a wonderful art feature. Those of you who will be working out in the uh, the uh, uh, fitness center, uh, there will be a couple of um, uh, machines that you'll be working on. And as you work, it will uh, activate the art feature that's right at the front entrance, a very exciting feature uh, of the center. Uh, next door to the center and part of the construction project is the beautiful Sullivan Gateway, which had fallen into great disrepair, a wonderful historic feature in our community, really the entrance to the uh, Esplanade, the City Park Esplanade, and that is being uh, restored in conjunction with the Carla Madison Rec, uh, Rec Center. Uh, thank you. We still have some work to do, but uh, you'll be able to see some of the, uh, 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 the first two phases of that restoration work, and it is stunning. Um, program features for Carla Madison include an eight-lane lap pool, a leisure pool, a multi-purpose room, a kid watch uh, room, a gymnasium, a full-size gymnasium, a fitness center, um, group exercise room, and on the corner um, of the center, we know we lost it to the construction, but there will be reinstalled a dog park, a small dog park on the south side uh, of the site. Um, <laughs> we always get a few claps for that, and you know we, we try to accommodate uh, those who had become used to the dog park that was an interim use there. Finally, uh, on the fourth floor, we didn't think we were going to be able to include it uh, in, and thanks to a lot of extra work on the part of our finance team and great uh, savings and, and uh, really financial management from our uh, construction team, we have been able to add the rooftop event space to the Carla Madison Center. It is spectacular. It'll feature over 2,000 square feet of exterior space, 2,000 square feet of interior space, and some stunning views of the city skyline and the mountains behind. On the east side of the center, there will be a three-story climbing wall. You can see it. It looks it, right now. It looks like a very large concrete. Uh, um, Structure on the east side, that is the climbing wall. It'll be accessed from the second level of the center. The leisure pool will have a lazy river, a warm lap pool, a two-story slide, and a small waiting area for our littlest people. And um, lots of natural light throughout the building, into the gymnasium, into the pool, those walking along the breezeway that has a great view of uh, Denver East High School, our partner. Uh, it will be able to look right into the leisure pool as they're walking uh, through the space. Um, just a couple of fun facts. The eight-lane diving pool holds 284,000 gallons of water. Um, there were over 322 tons of steel building this uh, center. 
um, and lots of other amazing facts. So we hope uh, we are um, looking for an opening in uh, late fall of this year. So please keep an eye on it, and we'll be over here to answer any of your questions. Thank you. And now, uh, I would like to invite up and introduce some tremendous partners of our department. Um, uh, Deputy Chief uh, David Quinones and your commander from District 6, Ron Sonier. Thank you and good morning. Like uh, Happy said, I'm David Quinones. I'm the Deputy Chief of Operations. Uh, Chief White is out of town, was unable to, uh, to attend this, but this is one of his favorite events and he's sorry that he couldn't be here, so he sends his apologies. A quick overview for the city. Um, several of, of these events ago, we had mentioned our commitment to body-worn cameras for the officers. All officers on patrol now have body-worn cameras. They are, they're active. That's all part of uh, the city's commitment. Thank you. To, to be open and, and transparent. And we are still shooting for a mid-year uh, date for all officers that work off-duty secondary employment to have body-worn cameras. So it's, uh, we're right on schedule to, to get that going. So it's, it's good that we have this venue because just about everything that we do uh, is, is a partnership. I work with George, I work with Ashley, with Happy, really to address the problems that that we are faced with. No longer can the police really resolve issues by themselves. Um, a couple of years ago, we had a, a gang issue that arose, and the mayor created an impact team. That impact team still remains in effect. We've learned a lot of lessons in how to address gang violence, especially the retaliatory gang violence. We use technology, we use partnerships with not just law enforcement and other city agencies, but with the community as well to address that gang violence, and we've seen some tremendous success. This year, we have a reduction so far year to date of 3% in crime across the city. That's despite Despite, thank you. Despite the increase in population, despite the increase in, in calls that we go to every year, last year we had a record number of, of police contacts. We had 600,000 police contacts. Now, what's significant about that is 285,000 of those were proactive contacts by the police, and that's what we push for. If you read across the country what is happening, there, there's some cities, big cities, that are talking about depolicing. The officers are not doing what they're paid to do. I can't speak for those cities, but I can tell you now that last year we had 66,000 more proactive contacts by your police department than the year before. And that with fewer arrests. Our goal is not to make arrests, it is to problem solve. We push our officers to problem solve their, their um, responses. Um, we don't want transactional contacts. To, uh, so to speak, where we, here's your ticket, here's your report. We really want transformational contacts where we can explain what's going on. That's the goal. Really, that's the goal of community policing. It's not a program. It's, it's not one event. It's every contact that we make. And if we can do that with the 600,000 contacts, we're going to really improve this city, continue to improve this city, which is a great city to begin with. So that's the broad overview for the department. I'll be in the back. Uh, your commander, who really should, can speak about what's going on in your area, although this is a unique area because across the streets, District 2, two blocks to the south is District 3, but we are in District 6. So that is Commander Ron Steiner, who is one of the most responsive commanders that we have in, in, in the city. So, Ron? Thank you, Chief. I uh, wanted to, like I said, introduce myself. I'm rapidly approaching my one-year mark in District 6. So I've been here, I keep getting, you know, the new District 6 commander, but it's going to be a year coming up here next month. So uh, it's been a very fast year. I wanted to talk a little bit about District 6 is a very diverse police district. We have the smallest geographical area. I know Councilman New talked about, you know, we are a small geographical area. We have a high population. We serve individuals from the lowest level of the economic chain to businesses at the highest end. And we have to be very responsive to all of those. We continue to balance everyone's constitutional rights across the board, no matter where you are on that. I value that very importantly. Uh, the chief of police talks about crime prevention is our main focus and what we're out there to do. We're here to 
to work on crime prevention as we go through that. Some of the ways that you can do that is make sure you're working with your district commander. As he said, we're in a unique position right here where there's three different districts that are out there. So I would encourage you to know who your district commander is, work with them. If you don't know who they are, I encourage you to reach out, introduce yourself, and to make yourself known to them. The way I can do my job better is through listening and communicating with you. So I really do encourage that communication as we go out there. I was asked to touch a little bit about traffic speeds and stuff that are out there. District 6 is out there. We deal with traffic issues, traffic crash investigations. The police department recently hired a bunch of civilian crash investigators, which will free up my officer's time to go out there and do some more proactive work as we go through. So we have that new aspect out there. We have speed trailers that are out there. Councilman New has offered to purchase me an additional speed traffic trailer for my neighborhood. So I would act or ask or seek your input in where you would like that to see. If you're having those issues, you need to communicate to me. I will address those issues. I will address through our traffic and special ops area that also assist me in dealing with the traffic and stuff that's out there. Uh, encourage everyone here to step up, step up and help us within the crime prevention. We need you to be watchful neighbors. Uh, programs like Neighborhood Watch have been out there. We need to renew that and come back to it. I would encourage you to know who your neighborhood organization is and stay in contact with them. Uh, programs like See Something and Say Something out there. If you see something suspicious, we need you to report it to us. Reach out to the communication center. If it's a non-emergency thing, you can send me an email. I'll have my business card in the back. Or you can always send it. A simple one is district6 at denvergov.org. Or I could spell my whole name out, but people can, or D-I-S-T-6 at denvergov.org. We also have the new pocket gov, Denver, you know, DPD's virtual neighborhood which I would encourage you to get involved with, sign up for that so that you can get the crime alerts there. You can communicate with me, my crime prevention officers and the officers that are out there. You can also access the 311. I know they have a table back here. I would encourage you to reach out. Communication is vital for me to successfully do my job that we're out there. In District 6, if you've been anywhere around Civic Center Park, the State Capitol, 16th Street Mall, we also have First Amendment assemblies that occur on a daily basis. These assemblies go from as little as one person up to we've had events with upwards of 50,000 people at these events. My goal and the police department's goal as we strive to go through there is to make sure it's a self you know, a safe event for everybody and that everybody goes home safe and that you're allowed to express your First Amendment rights mm -hmm. and we continue to work with that as it goes through. Some of the successes that we've seen in my district in my year is that we did see some increased security and partnership in the downtown area with additional officers, thanks to uh, the mayor and his staff stepping forward and allowing us some additional safety security. So if you haven't been down to the 16th Street Mall, I'd encourage you to go down there and see and, and experience the fill and stuff. Uh, also created an additional bike patrol working with Councilman News office, the mayor's office. We put together a additional dedicated bike patrol unit for the Colfax bid and partnering, partnering with them. And we've seen an, you know, that that has caused a decrease along the area and has allowed for a lot of positive impact. So you have the bike officers that are out there. There was a multi-agency approach to address the issues along the Cherry Creek bike path last year and all the problems that we were seeing along that. I think we've done a pretty good job. I routinely get down on the bike path, whether it's riding a bike or running or just keeping an eye on it. And we've done a real good job, but I wouldn't be able to do that without all of the partnerships from everyone else. And just last in closing, and I'll be at the back if you have questions, concerns, I got my business card with all my numbers back there. So come see me, I encourage you to get that is how can you help? One small way that you can help is in theft for motor vehicles. Make sure you're locking your vehicles, even if you are in a secured parking garage. 
We're seeing a lot of problems with that. Uh, remove your valuables from the vehicle or at minimum put them so that they're not seen. A lot of the crimes as I look through and I'm held accountable on a weekly basis, I look through the reports and what it is, you know, a lot of cars that are getting stuff taken from are unlocked and they leave valuables like laptops, iPods, cell phones charging and stuff. So help me out and help yourself out doing that. And if you see something suspicious, report it. I, I can't emphasize enough about communication. And when you do report it to us, I would ask that you ask at minimum for a contact back from that officer instead of being the person that calls in and says, you know, there's a suspicious party out here but I don't want contact from the police. At minimum, ask for a phone call back from that officer to give him the feedback, and you may have additional information that might be valuable for it, and you'll know that he was here. It's one other way to hold me accountable. So I will kind of close with that to keep us on, uh, I know we're a little over time, but I am available for any questions in the back, so. Thank you, Commander. I want to thank all of our presenters.